Hello, welcome. My name is Gordon Noble. I'm from the University of Aberdeen, and this is uh, Archaeological Research in Progress talk, uh, which is a national conference organised each year by Archaeology Scotland and the Society, Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, supported by Historic Environment Scotland. So this talk is about the Picts and uh, a hill fort called Mither Tap in Aberdeenshire. Now the Picts occupied a large part of uh, eastern and northern Scotland. Uh, they're first mentioned in late Roman writings as these troublesome groups who lived north of the of the frontier. And in the post-Roman period, they go on to become these powerful series of kingdoms occupying eastern Scotland. And one of a series of kingdoms in Scotland uh, at this time, or what we now know as Scotland. So there were Britons down in the southwest, Northumbrian Anglo-Saxons in the southeast, uh, the Scots of Dal Dalreda uh, in the west, uh, and from the late 8th century onwards, increasing Viking influence uh, in the far north. So the Picts are the group I want to focus on today. Um, and really, we know very little about the Picts from a historical perspective. So we only have one real series of, of native documents, and that's the Pictish King Lists, um, which are uh, simply a list of kings, but they also have this uh, amazing origin myth appended into one version, which talks about Cruthni, the father of the Picts, and he has uh, seven sons. And the sons have names like Fief uh, for Fife, um, Kate for Caithness. So essentially... This origin myth is a claim to territory. And one of the, the sons mentioned in that um, origin myth is, is Key, which seems to equate to modern-day Aberdeenshire, um, northeast Scotland. Um, so, as I say, first mentioned in, in late Roman sources, the Picts, um, how did these societies develop through time? And that's a, a question that, that our Northern Picts project, the University of Aberdeen, has been trying, trying to solve. And one of the main focuses of the project um, has been Pictish power centres, so looking at the development of, of elite uh, fortified settlements and, and centres, um, developing from the late Roman period through into the early medieval period. And we know that these are really important sites in, in the Pictish period. They seem to be the places that, that kings lived and places through which power was enacted and, and maintained. Um, but really, in terms of sites on the ground, we have very few. So whereas we have uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of Iron Age hill forts across Scotland, um, there's a real problem in identifying Pictish period ones. So really, again, we're struggling with, with, with a lack of data often. Uh, but very occasionally, we have really important clues from place names and from the limited historical sources that can help us pinpoint those Pictish power centres. Um, and we were quite lucky to have those hints, those clues, uh, with a really prominent site in Aberdeenshire in, in North East Scotland, um, a site known as, as Mither Tap, um, which is located on top of uh, the Benahi Hill Range. Um, and Benahi is this really prominent landmark across North East Scotland. You can see it from, from miles away. It's quite a, an iconic. Uh, place and 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 landmark um, to people in northeast Scotland, um, and the the hints to its importance in the in the Pictish period are uh, its place name. So the place name seems to mean something like the mountain or the peak of K. So it looks like it's um, got that element K from the Pictish uh, uh, kingless from that origin myth of Cruthni and and his sons. Uh, one of the sons being K, uh, that place name element within within the name itself. Um, we also have um, two lost Gaelic sagas that come from uh, the site or seem to, re to refer to the site and to this area of Aberdeenshire. Uh, and these, all we have for these are, are the titles, um, and they are The Ravaging of Benahi and The Ravaging of the Plain of K by Gallo, son of, son of Hebel. So these, these two, two stories, these sagas, which we only have the title surviving in, in, in Irish sources, um, suggest that there were major social and political events happening in the vicinity of Benahee 
in the first millennium uh, AD. So the site itself today, Mother Tap, um, is uh, this very striking hill fort located on top of Benahi. So we have the granite tor um, on top, and then just below that we have a, a, a rampart, an upper rampart, enclosing a small area um, for buildings or structures, uh, and then a lower rampart, which encloses the, the lower slopes of, of the peak um, of Benahi. Um, so they're really impressive uh, hill fort, and here's the entrance over in this direction. So, and, and here's a plan showing again the granite tor, the lower uh, the ramparts and the upper ramparts marked in green. So the site has actually been investigated um, before in, in the 19th century um, by Christian McLagan, uh, who was uh, one of the early, Scotland's earliest female archaeologists, um, born in Stirling and um, uh, a really important early archaeologist. Um, and, and Christian worked on uh, Benahi, um, undertaking excavations, um, and in her 1881 publication, Chips from Old Stones, uh, she produces this 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 plan of uh, Mother Tap, showing again the tor, um, the upper uh, rampart, the lower rampart, and you can maybe just make out uh, uh, various buildings uh, that she plots in on this plan. Here's the entranceway again. And also, um, towards the, the, the top of this drawing, she marks in the position of a well, which its position had uh, largely been lost since, since the 19th century. So, as part of our, our project, we set out to investigate all these elements. So, looking at, uh, for example, the, the, the upper citadel uh, here, um, the uh, rampart itself, um, the area of the well, could we identify that? And also some of the settlement structures uh, inside. So we set out a program, got scheduled monument consent from Historic Environment Scotland uh, and set off to dig. And these were our trenches marked on the left here in red, um, investigating various elements uh, of the fort. And really just trying to get a, a baseline um, data for the site in terms of its dating uh, and its character. So here's one of our trenches, trench trench one, marked on the left here, and this targeted the lower rampart wall of the fort. Um, and this is a really impressive feature. Um, all that survived of the wall itself were, was the rubble core, but also a few courses of the wall face here. And this was built actually on these huge granite boulders. You can maybe just see in the center of the photograph there. Um, and these seem to be um, creating a, a foundation over um, uh, a whole pile of, of rubble. So it looks like the fort has been built, built out into the, into the hill slope um, of, of the hill. So huge engineering project really to create um, uh, the platforms and areas um, uh, that uh, people could occupy actually inside the fort. But it also maybe hints that, that, that there was an earlier structure, an earlier fort actually on the hill, uh, and this is a later uh, phase of that. Um, so we got uh, samples from underneath uh, these big foundation stones, samples from the wall core itself. And then just inside um, the wall face here, just above the gallery, which seems to be some sort of walkway feature um, linking the buildings and, and, and the rampart, uh, in the lower uh, citadel, we find platforms just inside the wall face, uh, round about where Christian McLagan uh, depicts structures and buildings within within the lower citadel. Uh, and we had almost a, a meter of deposits of uh, occupation, midden deposits, essentially the rubbish that people have thrown, thrown away from occupation within the fort. And that included things like cattle bone, pig bones, sheep bone, and even fish bones, which is quite remarkable considering how highly elevated the site um, is uh, in, in the landscape. Uh, so that's really exciting um, bioarchaeological data, so we can use the bone to date it, we can use it to characterize the uh, economy uh, of the site as well. Um, and we also re-identified the well that uh, Christian McLagan had, had plotted and recorded in her 1881 publication. 
Um, so this was located um, close to the uh, uh, end of the, the rampart, just where it butts up against a, another granite tor. Um, and we uncovered uh, the well by peeling back the heather and uh, the, the uh, turf that had built up over um, the backfilled well. So essentially it looks like it was uh, backfilled by um, uh, shepherds in the 19th century stopped their animals falling back into, into the well here. Uh, and we had to do some uh, extreme archaeology. There were huge boulders actually in the well chamber and we had to get all sorts of ropes and pulleys to, to get the, the stones out. But it was well worth it. So you can see plotted here, um, the well actually has steps leading down to the well chamber here. And as soon as we removed all the rubble, it was quite remarkable, um, the well began to function again. So essentially it's collecting the water off the hills into the small chamber um, and uh, within a few hours the well had filled back up to the lip of, of, of the uh, well chamber. And here's a, a close-up, um, a drone shot uh, showing the remarkable well structure with the steps leading down from the occupation area within the lower settledal uh, down to the well. And as far as we can see the well appears to be contemporary with the fort. It's built up, up against the rampart wall which you can see on the bottom um, uh, side of, of the photograph here next to the ranging rod. Um, so it looks to be a, a contemporary feature of, of the fort, so a really elaborate well structure uh, within, within the fort itself. Uh, and basically wherever we dug on the hill, um, we found evidence for people actually occupying and living uh, in the Pictish period uh, on the hill. So this is up by the granite tor, um, and uh, this is Zach here excavating a two by two meter trench. And even just below the granite tor, we found lots of evidence for, for burning, for uh, occupation. Um, and, and this location actually implies that people were actually probably occupying the upper summit here, the granite tor, uh, which is also suggested by um, how some of the rubble um, from perhaps this upper area spills down onto the lower slopes below. So clear evidence that uh, you know the, the various levels of the fort, the lower citadel, the upper citadel, and even the granite tower were actually occupied uh, in, in the early medieval uh, Pictish period. Um, we've got some nice small finds from the site as well. So up in the upper citadel, in trench four um, here, we got nice um, uh, layers of, of, of uh, occupation material that included things like uh, handmade pottery, that's exceptionally unusual uh, in the Pictish period. Um, we had a very little understanding that there even was a, a potting tradition amongst the Picts until some of the recent uh, excavations in, in Aberdeenshire. Um, and here a little uh, gaming piece as well. So real um, uh, insights into the kind of everyday uh, material culture of the people who were occupying uh, this site but also evidence for um, high status activities as well, so metalworking evidence. So uh, in, in my hand here on the right, uh, you can see a tiny little crucible, and this would have been for melting precious metals uh, in, in the early medieval period. Uh, and this is a diagnostically early medieval form, uh, Pictish period form uh, for this uh, crucible. And that came from... Um, uh, the upper uh, citadel occupation as well, where we had other evidence of buildings and structures and walls within within the fort. So it's uh, a really exciting um, findings. It shows that there is good preservation of the archaeology, um, despite the antiquarian excavations here um, and uh, various kind of modern disturbance that's happened over uh, recent years. So it shows there's good in situ archaeology um, that provides material for dating the fort. Um, and uh, we just got the dates back uh, a few months after the excavation uh, and very happily it showed that all of the uh, features we dug, um, so the occupation in the lower citadel, in the upper citadel, um, and uh, uh, in association with the ramparts and the foundations of the ramparts, uh, all date to the first millennium AD. So, um, from the 7th to the end of the 8th century AD. So it shows that this site is firmly occupied in the Pictures period. Uh, clearly um, a really important site there, judging by the amount of labor, 
when buildings and structures um, have gone into uh, constructing this site. Um, so really watch the space in terms of developments. We hope to go back to the site uh, over the coming years and try and flesh out the picture of what this Pictish um, site would have looked like in the 7th and 8th centuries. Um, certainly the, the place name uh, and the archaeology suggests this is one of the key centres of the Picts in, in northeast uh, Scotland in, in the Aberdeenshire area uh, and really makes sense of some of the archaeology on the slopes of the hill and, and in the environs of Benahy. So one of the most impressive class 2 Pictish stones from Aberdeenshire, the Maiden Stone, comes from uh, the lower slopes of Benahy. And here you can see the Christian uh, cross on one side uh, and some of the uh, classic Pictish symbols like the, the swimming elephant or the Pictish beast here, a mirror and a comb, uh, and this um, tower type symbol here. Um, and so this, this monument um, uh, is, is here for a reason uh, and it's likely that the Pictish fort on Mother Tap as, as an elite centre explains its position here. Uh, but there's also actually another fort on the slopes of Benahy at uh, the Maiden Castle. And Murray Cook's excavations have shown that this site was uh, occupied uh, from the 4th to the 7th centuries AD, so overlapping at least partly in time with uh, the site on top of the hill at uh, Mother Tap. So a really exciting uh, a landscape um, uh, evidence that this site was and its uh, surrounds was really important uh, in this picture speed, and that's something we hope to find out more. Right, so uh, that's me for, for the lecture. If you want to find out more, uh, the Northern Picks Project has recently published this, this book by uh, Berlin, um, and you can get it all all good bookshops and uh, online as well, and find out about uh, the progress of the project over the last uh, five years or so. Um, and if you want to find out more about Northern Picks, we have a Facebook uh, page and a Twitter page, uh, and also uh, a University of Aberdeen uh, website about the project as well. So thanks very much for listening. Thanks to Archaeological Research and Progress, Archaeology Scotland, Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, and to Historic Environment Scotland for funding the conference uh, and also for funding various uh, projects by Northern Picks over, over the years. Thank you very much.